Well, I'm so uh, excited about the conversation we're about to have. Uh, we are recording this uh, a, the week after the open AI situation, fracas, uh, disagreement, prom school night, fallout. Uh, I don't know what it was, but it certainly made the headlines. And uh, my guest today is somebody who uh, I think uh, really can talk to us uh, in some great detail about that company. She is Karen Howe, contributing writer at The Atlantic. She has been uh, reporting on uh, the AI uh, beat for several years, uh, and unlike many journalists working in the field, she is also an MIT graduate, so she can bring her <laughs> math and engineering chops to bear. She's also working on a book about AI, which we will dig into. Um, Karen, thank you for breaking your Thanksgiving holiday to speak to me. Not at all. Thank you so much for having me. It's very exciting to be here. Well, I mean, you must have had the week uh, the, the, uh, from, from I can't even imagine where, because I think you were over in Hong Kong uh, when the, the news that Sam Altman had been fired by the board broke. You've then probably been recording, uh, reporting 24 hours a day and now you're in New York. But uh, how did you find out about it and what was your reaction? So I'd actually come from Hong Kong to DC the week that the news broke. And I was actually in the middle of a um, conversation with a former OpenAI contractor when the news broke and both of us had our phones muted. So we were just talking to each other, talking. And then I just checked my phone very briefly to, to check on the time and I saw 20 missing notifications. <laughs> and I was like, hold on, I think something is happening. And then I realized what had happened. I looked at him and went, Sam Altman has been fired. And both of us were like, holy crap. <laughs> like, <laughs> like we were so, it was so surreal because we had been talking about OpenAI. We'd been talking about the leadership and about like work that had been done. It, it, was, it was just really, really wild. Um, and I did not expect it at all. Um, a, a lot of people have sort of asked me this because subsequently I kind of pulled together a bunch of the reporting that I'd been doing for the book into a piece for The Atlantic. And they were like, but your piece had so much clarity. And I was like, yeah, this is like hindsight is 2020. <laughs> right, right. I'm so able you, to say, yeah. Well, uh, we have the benefit uh, of having you here because actually that book that you're writing about AI is not about AI in general. You have a, you have a focus, right? Which is this very interesting organization, OpenAI. It is, um, it, it, it does focus a lot on open AI. It's not, I wouldn't say that it is um, 100% an open AI book, but it talks a lot about the AI industry, um, its direction, its impacts. And because open AI is such an important part of that story and has become the organization setting the pace and direction of AI development, it is, open AI is the main character basically. Um, but yeah. it tries to extend far beyond just the organization itself to also looking at broadly um, this kind of central question of how do we develop AI that betters humanity, which is kind of based on it's... OpenAI's mission. It's sort of examining its its mission its and mission. looking at the ground at like, how do you literally do this? So so let's that's your context, right? You've spent years reporting. You've got this this book uh, that that looks at that question and you get these 20 notifications, uh, you're, you're 30 minutes late to the news now, uh, and you'll think, holy, and every expletive is running through your brain. Um, what, 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 do you, what, is, what is your first response, your first thinking, your first rationalization of, of what is uh, going on? My first thought was the board statement is very, it sounds very intense, right? That like, it sounds like, Altman has been lying to the board, that he's duplicitous. Um, and what's interesting is in interviews that I've had um, for the book, Altman is a very, he is a very polarizing character. There are people that find him, um, you know, that exactly how the boards are described it. And there are people who really, really trust him and think that he is one of the best leaders of our generation. So um, that, that my first thought was sort of, what did he do to make the board think that way? And as the news started rolling out, my first thought was, uh, or my 10th thought <laughs> was, um, 
this seems to be like a power struggle between the ideologies that have right. been in open AI for a long time. Um, and this isn't the first time that there's been kind of an outburst um, that has kind of bubbled up to public knowledge. Um, there have been two other instances in which a power struggle between ideologies has created a rift. The first one was when Elon Musk, one of the mm -hmm. co-founders of the company, left and took all of his money with him. Um, and the second one was the open AI anthropic split or how people have described it to me as the divorce. The divorce, where, right. Where it was very similar, like ideological struggle. Um, and so then I was thinking, could I, is there, if I go back through my notes, because I hadn't, you know, I'd been, I'd been gathering like all of these interviews and um, I didn't remember all the details. So I was like, if I go back through my notes and just look at the last year, um, can I find sort of some kind of context for understanding right. what happened in this particular moment? I, I mean, it is, it is interesting that we do seem to be coming back to this, this ideological uh, d divide, which was also the way that I had, had analyzed it in, that, in those, those first few days. And, and maybe it's worth sort of saying something um, uh, uh, about that. Uh, when OpenAI was, was founded, it was a nonprofit, which had this nonprofit board. Uh, it had this mission to, to develop AI for the benefit of humanity. I mean, Silicon Valley loves its lofty goals. Uh, and it even had in the statement that uh, of the Charting, Char Charter Foundation that if another group was developing AI faster and better and more capably than OpenAI, OpenAI wouldn't compete, right. but would turn all its resources to helping to develop uh, safe, um, safe AI. Now, now this is kind, kind of interesting because this is happening, I guess, back in 2015. And I think at that time, the, the, this notion of safe and unsafe AI, um, the, the, the bit that had really captured everyone's imagination was this question of superintelligence that would turn us all into paper clips, right? There was Nick Bostrom's book a couple of years ago, and many of the people who were involved in the founding of OpenAI were at that Asilomar conference uh, where certain principles were, um, were defined. And it was really a conference that was extremely long term sort of cosmological style risks mm -hmm. of what might happen to um to humanity under the uh, as we go through this sort of existing knowledge knowledge frontier so I, i'm curious is, is to what extent do you think that that is the sort of seed corn kernel of intellectual consensus that that was was you know the the, the backdrop for the founding of of this organization <laughs> Consensus is sort of a hard word because I think um, each of the co-founders at OpenAI probably had different ideas and ideologies of why they were joining the organization. But certainly one of them was this kind of, as you said, like cosmological, like existential risk type um, ideology of if, if, if AI development, if we reach super intelligence and we didn't actually think through um, things well during its development, then, you know, it's going to be catastrophic. It's going to be, uh, it's going to destroy humanity. Um, and, but I wouldn't necessarily, I, I wouldn't say that it, it's interesting. Sam Altman, um, he also co-founded OpenAI in part at the time saying this publicly. Um, like he, he was making the rounds with Elon Musk saying, you know, AI could be dangerous and we do want to guide it carefully, but I don't actually think that he himself is, you know, a, a, an, an intense doomer, so to speak. Um, he, I think he, based on, you know, my own understanding, like I would say he's probably like middle of the road. Like he acknowledges that there's probably um, some existential risks, but that's like not really his main concern or his fixation in the same way that Doomer sort of like really fixate and obsess over this particular fear. Um, and so, and then of course there were a whole range of other researchers that were attracted to OpenAI that I think ran the gamut. Some just wanted to do really cool research and were given the money to do so. And that's what attracted them, you know? So um, that it was certainly a backdrop. It I, I don't know how pervasive it was among the actual people 
Um, but over time, because of this mythology, it certainly attracted many more people within to the organization that did align with this kind of doomer ideology. Mm-hmm. And um, that doomer ideology has persisted um, and led to these these ideological struggles that we're talking about. Yeah. It may be worth just for our, our audience to unpick what we mean when you refer to the, the, the Doomer ideology. I mean, the audience here has, there's a lot of people in Silicon Valley, there are a lot of people who are deeply steeped in the tech and I expect them to, to sort of be uh, familiar with it because they're rubbing up against these people in the, in the coffee shops and, and so on, or they may, may, may take that, that stance themselves. But we also have a very wide global audience and senior execs who are perhaps not as, not as close. And I, I guess, let, let's un, unpick that a little bit. So there is a, is it right in saying that there's a, a group of, um, researchers and, and thinkers, some who, of whom are, uh, you know, at the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford, some are independent researchers who say yeah. that, you know, logically, when we think this through, uh, an, an intelligence that is more intelligent than us could be unaligned to our anything that might be beneficial to us, including the supply of oxygen and other things that we need, essentially. I mean, is that, is that, I mean that's a really, that's a, that's a very clumsy portrait, right, with crayons, but maybe you'd like to fill in the details. Yeah, I think the, this kind of ideology that is shorthanded for Doomer, but, um, <laughs> you know, well, like, if we were to unpack it more, is basically that um, digital intelligence um, can rapidly accelerate because I, I was actually speaking with Jeffrey Hinton about this extensively because he sort of recently flipped. He's one of the considered the godfathers of AI who um, really ushered in a lot of AI development and mm-hmm. very recently left Google because of this existential risk. And I was asking him to sort of unpack his uh, argument. And the way that he would put it is we have these digital intelligences um, that are um, sort of they're very good at quote unquote, transferring knowledge, like humans are, are, we are very bad at it. We say one thing to another person, it's like broken telephone, and we don't quite actually all get on the same page. And it's slow, a slow process for us us to like educate one another to actually combine knowledge, whereas digital, digital intelligences can combine knowledge very quickly, you could see how that would, you know, rapidly escalate to a point where they become much smarter than humans. Um, And then at that point, when the the way the Hinton puts it, when have we ever sort of had a smarter species treat a less smart species well, right. and therefore you end up in a situation where um, you know a super intelligence is going to end up being really really detrimental to humanity? Um, I would couch this a lot by saying that there are many many critiques of this ideology, um, and I think many valid critiques of this ideology. One of which is that intelligence itself is such a squishy term and smartness, like if something is smarter than another, is such a squishy term um, that it's really, there is no actual consensus within the AI community or the broader scientific community, like biology, neuroscience, psychology of what actually it constitutes intelligence, what makes humans capable of the mm-hmm. things that we can do. And if we're actually getting any closer to recreating that in the digital world. And of course, layered on top of that, there's this other uh, challenge of a digital intelligence would need to, you know, like they need to act in the real world. That's part of the reason why humans are effective is we live with bodies and exist in three dimensional space. And can we, is it actually um, a concern that we have something that can do lots of computation within the digital realm, but can't necessarily do anything within the physical realm. Um, and then, of course, the one of the last most prominent critiques is that this kind of discourse has also taken a lot of oxygen out of the room in mm-hmm. um, acknowledging that there are many, many, many harms of current AI systems that we have not solved that arguably are very connected to if you want so-called aligned AI, AGI, super intelligence of future, you probably want to fix those things now. But many of the um, many of the kind of obsessions over this super intelligence future end up clouding the right. kind of discriminatory impacts or other like negative societal impacts today. 
you know, it's interesting that you call this uh, an, an ideology. Um, and in my writing, my analysis, I've also thought of it as a little bit ideological. Uh, and it's connected more broadly to some, some other ideas that I, I will explore in future conversations. Um, and, and I think it will be useful for us to also touch on this, this phrase, which I'll, I'll stick out there now. We'll come back to it a bit later. The, P doom, which is um, the probability of doom that gets thrown around by by some of the, the, the people in this in this group. So yeah. this this um, kind of belief system, this doctrine, uh, which is about you know the the the, the potential paths towards a reasonably close um, you know existential uh, 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 challenge, it, it does has in, infused some parts of OpenAI, but it seemed like. Not everyone subscribed to it. And as you say, there was this tension and there was that first, it's like the Catholic Church, right? There was the first mm -hmm. schism with when Musk left and the second one when uh, Dario Amade, who was running the safety group, left to found Anthropic with, with uh, Jack. Dario has been on my TV show and Jack was on the, the podcast um, a while back and also uh, Dario and Daniela Amade as well. Um, and and that th you couldn't square the... Uh, uh, the, a, a more commercial approach to developing AI with people who were really concerned that these things might get get out of um, out of control, and, and it, it seem and is it the case then that that difference of opinion never really got resolved within the OpenAI team? I mean, it clearly didn't get resolved in the board because the board sort right. of stepped in, but it, it right. didn't get resolved in the team by the looks of things. Yeah, I think what happened is, so if, if you hold true this mission, if, if, if you were to believe and sort of um, steel man everyone's argument within OpenAI for how they're actually trying to build AGI that betters humanity, um, I think there's, there's two extreme opposite arguments. There, one is the techno-optimist argument, which is, well, we want to build products that people use and through using them, through engaging with the world, through getting their feedback, we're going to, of course, get better and better technology that betters humanity because it will sort of be this iterative um, cycle. And ultimately, user feedback is like the central kind of channel and commercialization is the central channel through which to arrive at this. So it's, it's sort of um, AGI for the betterment of humanity under the banner of capitalism, right? And then the other opposite extreme is this kind of doomer camp, which is um, like we get better AGI by deploying, by potentially advancing it ourselves faster than anyone else, studying it in kind of controlled settings, um, and then iterating, trying to develop better techniques for um, making sure that it goes well before someone else gets there that might not have sort of similar intentions. Mm. Um, and I think the, the Doomer camp also splits into then people who also think we should not be, um, we should not be accelerating or developing this at all, right? right? All of those were within OpenAI in part because there were people who joined, um, well, I should start by saying in 2019, OpenAI created a new legal structure. So it started right. as a nonprofit. And then in 2019, because it realized that it couldn't actually raise enough capital through its nonprofit, it nested a for-profit within the nonprofit, what it calls a tax but, profit. But, but I think the, the, the rationale there wasn't, that, that was actually to do with scientific discovery, right? It was the discovery that um, the transformer model that had come out of Google is really, really effective at building certain types of AI tools, but it needs so much data and therefore so much co compute that you would need hundreds of thousands then millions then tens of millions of dollars to do the training, right? And they probably didn't know that in 2015 when they started. I would actually disagree with oh, that great. in that um, Ilya Sutskever, who's the chief scientist, who was one mm. of the main characters of the kind of tumult this past weekend, um, he had always believed that it would ultimately come to data and compute, and he was actually seeking an algorithm to fit that. So Transformers ended up becoming the algorithm that he, he said, wow. okay, okay. Yeah, this is the algorithm that we should use because it's, it can scale. But the um, belief that it would come down to rapid scaling of data and compute came before the discovery of the transformer or the invention of the transformer. So um, it, the discussions around um, it being capital intensive started happening 
um, quite early on within the organization. It, it was just that they didn't realize how quickly it would escalate. So right. once they started calculating the numbers, realizing how quickly it would, it would escalate, that's when this tension arises. It's also right around the time when Elon Musk takes his money away. So there was sort of a, a, mo a moment of acute financial crisis where right. not only have you realized that you need exorbitant amounts of money, also like your one of your main backers has taken all the money away. Right. Um, and so they create this structure of a nonprofit that's governed that governs a um, for-profit or what they call a capped profit. Capped profit. Yeah. Um, and the reason why you see all of these ideologies um, come into open AI is not just because of the founding mythology, but because literally people are excited about the for-profit or they're excited about the non-profit and they join because they buy into one or the other kind of right. legal structure. Um, right, right. So, and, so a bit like that, um... That, that weekend camping between the cannibals and the vegans, there was bound to be some kind of tension and maybe even a bit of bloodshed, right, at some point. <laughs> there was bound to be tension. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and so that kind of um, accelerated significantly after the release of ChatGPT because ChatGPT suddenly makes OpenAI the hottest company in the world. Um, and also when you put technology in the hands of 100 million users, you start to observe sort of real world examples that either illustrate the techno optimism or the doomerism. Like right. you, can, you can sort of cherry pick your data to perfectly kind of steel man your argument that, oh, I was right all along. We do need to be very, very concerned or we do need to build fast, 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 um, in order to continue getting to this ultimate goal of bettering humanity. And, and when we, we look at what, the origin of some of that more recent tension, I think when, chat, when GPT-4 came out, uh, or was, was being developed, it went through this, this safety process. So, you know, roughly what you, you get um, is that you, you take this, this la la uh, language model, you train it on lots of text, it's trillions of tokens or trillions of words, um, and then you, you get this thing that can that has kind of got a compressed version of the Internet, uh, but it's it, it just spews out text. And so then you you fine tune it so that it can be answer questions and then you um, train it to be a good dog through this kind of Pavlovian process of, of treats if you get it right and, and sharp words if you get it wrong, which we call reinforcement learning with human feedback, which, which is designed to make the thing safe. And, and I guess that is a really interesting moment because when gpt4 was released openai released what's known as the, the safety card right the safety card said this is what gpt4 will do before we put in safety and you know one of the examples they did was uh, they, they showed was uh, how many people can i kill with one dollar and the original gpt4 would say you might not want to do that but then here's a bunch of ways you could do it right the rlhf gpt4 says i can't help you there right um, and 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 then you have this this rlhf process to, to make it safe and and that to me looks like a place where it could you could develop quite a lot of tension how much is enough yeah. how how good does a process need to be run in order to for, for us to feel that we have gone over and above to meet our our mission and and our ambition exactly. and, and, I, and in recent days i don't know if you've seen one of the uh, the guys who worked on the red team which is the team that aims to 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 break it has um, a guy called Nathan Labenz has has talked about, about how he video. yeah right he was on the he was on the red teaming and he he felt it wasn't being done properly and he even spoke to a board member I, I mean do you think that that process created tension that would have been before the release of ChatGPT because that was happening you know in the in the months before November uh, 2022 yeah. um, and that ChatGPT is a kind of just another accelerator to all of this. I do. I think that, um, well, so the, interestingly, the timeline was ChatGPT was a very last minute decision. Right, um, that's right so here, yeah. GPT-4 had actually been delayed um, a couple months before suddenly the leadership was pushing for a ChatGPT precisely because of this idea that, oh, we need to actually be more careful. We need more time to develop this these safety measures. Um, and so I think there was a little bit of tension, but it was relatively resolved because it had been delayed to try and add these measures. So there, I think the tension suddenly flared when it was like, we've delayed this thing, but then we decided to release this other thing anyway. But part of the reason is because OpenAI did not at all anticipate ChatGPT being a big deal. 
they yes, that's right. released it with the idea of we've already done sufficient RLHF reinforcement learning mm. on this older model GPT 3.5 and there was there were some people within the organization that were a little bit uncomfortable with this premise because they were like yes but adding a chat interface changes things um, but for for the most part most people were like the base model is safe we have actually done sufficient work on this, so let's just put it out. And then, of course, when it goes bonkers viral, then you end up in a situation where, yeah, there are a lot of different um, things that change when you put a chat interface on it. The first of which is becomes insanely popular, um, right. un unprecedentedly popular. Um, and so that's when the tension comes back of we delayed this other thing precisely because we didn't think it was ready. And now we released this other thing that we didn't know would be a big deal. And now that it is a big deal, we're realizing that it wasn't actually ready. And now we're also, there were, there were two camps of like pushing to still try to release GPT-4 as quickly as possible to build on the momentum of ChatGPT. Right. And then other people who are now suddenly like pulling back, pulling and, back. And, and, and the complicated bit was that they, Bing, Sydney, which yes. was, was actually on GPT-4, before ChatGPT had moved to GPT-4 and we had all of those those sort of funny Sydney um, moments uh, back in, I, it was a trillion years ago, I think just around the time of the Big Bang, but it may have been January, it was, which which is probably even earlier, uh, <laughs> so it feels. Um, so so uh, let's get to, let's get to the kind of, to the crux of, of this, this disagreement. So on, something happened on that Thursday and the Friday, the Friday when, when, when uh, Sam was actually fired, there are there are four board members involved. There's there's Adam D'Angelo who runs Quora, and Quora has a product called Poe, which is a, 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 a user interface over several LLMs. There's Tasha McCauley, about whom I, I know not not much. There's Helen Toner, who is a safety security um, researcher with a sort of national security um, angle, and then there's Ilya Sutskova, mm -hmm. and. And I'm just, I'm, I'm curious about what you think is that moment of that, that finally precipitates a decision and who the prime mover uh, of it, of it was. I think this is, this is like the, the huge question that everyone is asking. I, I don't know. Um, and this is something that I'm still trying to report out and um, it's, it's difficult to kind of sort the signal from the noise, but there was this, uh, report from Reuters, interestingly, that mentioned, um, that there were a group of employees, staff researchers that sent, um, a letter to the board, um, detailing, uh, concerns about a particular, um, what they called a breakthrough. And I, and I want to be clear that they specifically called it a breakthrough, um, at that, that, that they felt that could change kind of like the existential risk model. Um, mm. Was that the thing that precipitated the board's actions? Was it like the um, what Nathan said in the video about mm. like how he was unsatisfied with red teaming and also approached the board? We don't actually know. Like maybe there were actually many, many people that approached the board during this right. time. Um, oh, like Merge on the Orient Express, right? Where, right. where so, <laughs> well, somebody no approached the board, but it was so many all at the same time oh. in the dark. Yeah, yeah. We, have, we really don't know. Um, and but but I, I think a lot of people were quick to jump to the, the idea that Ilya led the actions. I am a bit more cautious about saying that I think he might have been instrumental, but I'm not actually sure that he led the action. Um, but yeah, of, of course he was a linchpin, but it is a, sort of an interesting, just from a personal relationships and personal dynamics perspective. I mean, Ilya officiated Greg Brockman's wedding. Right. Um, Sam Altman had personally recruited Ilya to join OpenAI and it had sort of been one of his like most prized or um, like talent grabs from Google. Um, and so it's a, it's a little bit unclear to me that Ilya would have swung so quickly the other way and then led this thing. But I do think that he might have had certain concerns that were bubbling up over time that would have um, caused him to align with hmm. other concerns that were bubbling up from um, other channels being brought yeah. to the board. I, I mean, it will be, uh, there's going to be an investigation and there's yes. going to maybe be a, a public report. I mean, my, my take on the process, um, you know, was that, you know, Thursday, the day before Altman is fired, um, 
the board is extremely small for the board yes. of like a hundred billion dollar company yes. uh, or organization, right? So you have a couple of execs, you have, um, or three execs, you've got three non-execs um, who have subject matter expertise, yes. uh, but don't necessarily have governance expertise and can't point to 20 or 30 years of, of governance and leadership experience where mistakes could have happened. And it's not about saying, oh, we should, we, they weren't suitable for the board. It was about saying there were empty chairs around the table yes. Um, yes. Of, of that board, uh, you know, anyway. So it would, would come under strain. Um, and, and I think one of the, the funny things is that given the, the remit of the, the board from the founding documents, which is essentially in their discretion, do they believe open AI is um, acting in the benefits of humanity? And given what Sam himself had told me in 2020, which was that if the board didn't like what he was doing, they could fire him mm -hmm. uh, and, and he would go and they'd find someone else. Um, it's, I think they were within their remit to actually kind of fire him, right? What they, what they probably- well, yeah, It's in the job description. Yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, <laughs> yeah, but this, is, this is something that I, I, I do feel very strongly about is people have been saying like the board was crazy and like went like rogue and whatever. I think they actually literally did their job so we shouldn't necessarily critique the fact that they did their job. I think we should critique who wrote the job description. <laughs> right. Who wrote the job description? Ab absolutely right. And that back to that idea of the, you know, the benefit of humanity, which is a, a really difficult thing to measure. Yes. Um, and and may maybe we could argue that, that communication from the board was for something like yes, this was I, I not well considered. The process by which they did the action, I think, was poorly executed. Right. But the action itself was actually literally in the job description. And and I think that exactly what you said, that it's very difficult to actually measure the certain things that um, the board is supposed to action on, which, again, goes back to how the job description was written. If you're going right. to put very vague definitions, very vague um, things that are prone to ideological interpretation in mm. there, you're going to get something like this. Right. Um, and the, to keep the board that small as well. I mean, the, the board had been actually bigger and then there were multiple people that sort of rapidly left in a uh, sequence and they didn't quite um, finish putting more board members in. But right. um, but it was still small, even when there were other board members there. And so the entire structure, the do job description, all of that, I think it's almost, it's almost a logical conclusion that it happened this way. Like I've sort of been trying to figure out um, over the last few days, like, is there any other way that this, that this particular moment, like the board being, um, voting against Sam, is there any other way that it could have happened other than right. an, a, a very dramatic explosion, you know? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I, I wonder that as well. Right. I mean, there, it's clear that there would have been disagreements, um, and, and kind of ongoing discussions in previous months. I think that will start to come out through reporting. Uh, but it's hard to imagine you you get here, um, you get here with, without that. And, and and then I think I get the guess the question is going to be, in a sense, um, you know, what does OpenAI end up end up looking like now? Yeah. And and my you know my take has been that this mission for the benefit of humanity is is really it's it's incomprehensible. It's like don't be evil or, you know, zombie flam brittle worst, which is a phrase I've just made up literally on the spot now, zombie flam br brittle worst. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Uh, it's impossible to run an organization against that because it's not it's not measurable. Um, and and I would wonder whether we will start to see um, uh, just a clearer migration towards a commercial business that has enough primary research because that gives it, that's what gives it strategic advantage mm -hmm. and, and does enough safety to keep its customers, its enterprise customers in particular happy and to keep, you know, public heat and the sort of fourth estate and the regulator at the right sort of level of, of, of comfort. Yeah. And, and this, this other structure will start to be forgotten. If not de jure, it'll be, de facto forgotten. I don't, I don't know. Is that a reasonable path forward, do you think, from your vantage point? I think that the consolidation of, of Sam's power is certainly um, the path forward. I mean, he's trying to, like, I don't think Sam is going to want to um, 
create this kind of vulnerability for himself again. Uh, right. Not just because it, it's vulnerability for him, but it is, you know, there was like widespread, um, it was horrible for all the employees involved as well. Like you, and it was, it was um, very um, uh, dramatic for all of, <laughs> for Microsoft, for all of Microsoft customers. Like, I think everyone kind of wants some, something more stable than what, what happened before. Right. Um, but I don't actually know that it's going to be a complete orientation now towards commercialization because there are employees still at the company that are very much of this other camp, of this doomer right. camp. They haven't left yet. I'm not sure if they're planning on leaving. We don't know. But I, I suspect that they're probably planning on trying to stay because if you put yourself in their shoes and you think about the mentality that you might have, if you genuinely believe that this technology could be catastrophic, it could be existential, you would do a lot. You would risk a lot. You would take drastic measures to try and redirect course. And if they think that Sam Altman is sort of representative of this other course that they uh, that could have these these terrible consequences, I think they would naturally try to stay within the company and continue trying to drive this other um, ideology forward. Mm. The other thing I think uh, is sort of difficult is within Silicon Valley, the talent pool itself is split. It's very, very hard, especially for OpenAI, which is, has scaled rapidly in the last year. It's hired hundreds of new people in the last year. Right. It's almost impossible to say, okay, let's hire hundreds more but like not have anyone from this other camp, only people that right. are like pro commercialization. The people that study AI, that study safety, that- um, Yeah, that they overlap, right? Know how, they, many of them are actually split on these ideological yeah. lines. So you're going to continue bringing more in. Well, I mean, you know, the scientists are split as well, right? We've seen this from, uh, you know, the IEEE did a survey a few months ago. You see it when you talk to them, uh, you see it on, on Twitter, you've, you've got, uh, uh, those who sit in the, the the really existential risk camp, those who sit in the catastrophic could be deeply, deeply problematic. Then you've got others who say, um, you know, there are real issues that, that and real harms that happen here and now uh, that, that, that need to be attended to. And there are others who say that this is just not going to be um, a, an issue. And, and I think that that degree of scientific disagreement is being reflected back out to... Um, you know how the how the AI researchers and developers um, also also think about it. But one of yeah. the things I, I find quite uh, that, that a lot of intellectual man gymnastics needs to be required, and maybe this is why these guys are AI researchers and much smarter than me, is how you reconcile this this fervent, deeply held belief um, that your this technology could be existential for a particular species, and and then spend all your time building it and trying to rush product releases out. And, I, and I'm not referring to people in the safety side necessarily, but I, I, you know, I think you, it, you, you certainly see, and it, 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 it seems like they're holding a lot of conflicting ideas in their, in their head. And I, I'm kind of curious about how they, how they do that. I mean, I think for the most part, it's different people within the, or the same organization that have these right. different views. There are the people that, that think that they need to productize the people's safety. But um, one of the things that our um, sources during the, the when we were writing the, our piece, um, my colleague Charlie Wartzel and I were writing our piece for The Atlantic. Um, one of the things our sources was talking about is that um, Sam, as the helm of the company, sort of has to, he has to get these two different camps to align. So usually what he says is, well, we want to productize to make the, enough money to continue doing the research, the safety right. research. So that's sort of how he um, resolves this kind of conflict that uh, many other people have pointed out. Um, and I think it's a sort of, a, I mean, it's an interesting argument. Like he, he, he's sort of saying like the technology is not at the point yet where we need to start withholding it. So while it's still okay and viable to release it, let's make a ton of money from it and then use that to kind of continue to um, build up our safety mechanisms. I mean, there are many people within the company and outside the company that completely disagree with this logic. And that is part of the reason why we see what we see. Right. Yeah, yeah, ab ab absolutely. I mean, I, I'm, I mean, I'm slightly sympathetic to the argument that um, you know when you don't know what the what the future is, you only can only figure it out by actually having the experiments 
out there, yeah. right? And starting yeah. to starting to learn um, about it. And one of the things that I find it sort of quite odd is, um, you know, I'm sitting in, in, in the UK, right? I'm sitting in London, is the idea that people carry around a, a P doom in their in their heads, right? So P doom for listeners who may not have a P doom is the probability of doom, where I guess doom means the extinction of humanity. Yeah. Uh, and, and people go around saying, yeah, my, my P doom is 10 percent um, uh, or my P doom is 15 percent. I heard a, a, a Lena Khan, who is runs the FTC in an interview. And, and even she has a P doom. I think that uh, I can't remember whether, whether it was zero or it was high or or not. But it's quite it's quite an interesting um, sort of anthropological observation in, in of itself. I mean, when you hear P doom, what do you what are you thinking? What are you thinking about, like? how that other person is, is thinking. I think the thing about P doom, um, that I personally feel is I, 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 I think it is a good mental exercise, not just a mental exercise. It is, it is a good exercise, um, for everyone to be thinking about, um, what are the harms? What are the risks both short term and long term? I, I think that is, it is good that people are doing that. What, I cannot really um, get behind is the quantification of it in a way that seems superior to all other methods of kind of qualifying harms. Um, mm -hmm. Like P doom, like the, the, the fact that there are numbers assigned makes it seem like there's some kind of really elaborate calculation that's happening that um, is, yeah, is inherently um, correct. And I just mm -hmm. don't, it's true, like no one yeah. actually knows what the probability of doom is and to assign a number and, and kind of, um, I don't know, to add sort of this veneer of, of uh, scientific um, integrity around the, mm. the probability of doom. I think that is what I don't really get behind. Like the, there yeah. is no scientific, you can't right. be scientific about really speculative things. No, that, that's right. And I think you, you, you um, use a great phrase there, which is scientific integrity. It's a great way. It's a great uh, tool of power, right? You know, control yep. the vocabulary, control the language. Um, and, you know, particularly if you, you are coming from that sort of intellectual heritage or that is maybe quantified, um, it carries a, a great deal of weight. And I guess like, like you, I think thinking about both the long term and the short term uh, the long term consequences and the real short term realities of of the technology are um you know extremely extremely important um, but, but there's something that you had said in your in a recent discussion i i i heard where you said well this is really all about power and i think that you know kind of fundamentally this is really what we are um what we're talking about right the the the, the disagreements between groups for the benefit benefit of humanity well, from whose from whom's, whose perspective, right? Are we um, looking at this, and who is uh, who is there to articulate their case, and who is not there? Those are questions of, of power, and in a sense, yeah. this is just a. This could also just be conceived of as a as a power struggle with some fancy sci uh, scientific terms uh, yeah. thrown into it. Uh, absolutely, I, I very strongly feel this because. I mean, if you just look at the entire, we've been talking about definitions the whole time and how everything is very squishy. AGI is squishy, betterment of humanity is squishy. I mean, what that actually enables is just a projection of your beliefs onto something, right? Mm. Like it's just an empty vessel to contain whatever the creator of AGI wants to define right. AGI as and whatever they want to define the betterment of humanity as. And as we said, the board is tiny and also, OpenAI is tiny. I mean, there's 770 employees, roughly, but it's tiny. And they all come from a very particular positionality within the world. Um, and the fact that we're even talking about these like very extreme ideological um, differences between techno-optimist and doomer is so specific to very right. particular <laughs> communities right. in the world. Yeah. <laughs> and so it is ultimately just... Um, it's about who has control of, of a technology that can project their ideology across the globe. Um, and of course, the more powerful that technology, the, the faster you're able to project your ideology, the faster you're able to amass resources, uh, commercialize, make money off of a technology, the more Game of Thrones style kind of power right. you're going to see around the control of it. 
And just that idea of exporting these cultural norms uh, through the technology, I think, is a really important one. And it's something that we saw through uh, social media, actually, kind of most, most obviously. I remember my, uh, you know, my mum, uh, you know, when he, she, she's in her 80s now, when she's in her 70s, signing up to Facebook. There was a point it was starting its decline. She's like, what does it's complicated mean on the marital status? And it's like, mm. <laughs> you know, when you're a 19-year-old Harvard dorm room kid and you can't get a girlfriend, you'll have it's complicated as a, as a yeah. status. And now that's been exported to, you know, 4 billion people. And I think that yeah. with with the AI products themselves, um, those types of affordances are being e exported. Um, I, I, you know, I didn't go to an American high school, but I've watched enough films set in American high schools over the last uh, 30 or 40 years. Um, and the answers you get from ChatGPT, which is a tool I use you know, pretty much every day, sound like the end of a high school debate <laughs> where the guy goes, in conclusion, we can say that uh, supersymmetry is da -da 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 -da, whatever it happens yeah. to be. And I'm thinking, that that's not the way that you would summarize an argument if you were in a British academic oh. institution yeah. or, you know, frankly, anywhere else. Right. So you're already starting to see those sorts of um, things emerge. And I think the fact that, as you say, that kind of Silicon Valley monoculture has now got this little crack between it, between what's called the accelerationists and the doomers or the decelerationists, um, is interesting for people like you and I who've, obs who've observed Silicon Valley. You've done it for the last few years. I sort of started looking at it in, in the mid nineties. And, but it, it, it's also being exported in places where it's just yeah. not a relevant yeah. um, argument, but it's becoming relevant uh, for, for that reason. So, so I, I'm, I'm wondering about what you think just in the last few minutes, this, what you think the, the wider industry, the wider ecosystem, uh, people watching this will, will take away from the interpretation of this very important thing that happened in OpenAI um, uh, earlier. Um, will it, do you think people are starting to say, well, we need to think about other ways of sourcing, de working with AI, that we need to find um, ways of having a, a, the internal capability ourselves, whether it's a company or even it's being done at a national level? Um, or, or will people just fall back into the fact that OpenAI's products are far and away the best, right? They just perform better than others, and that's just more convenient. I mean, where, where, what, what's, your, your, what's your sense? I think for companies that have the resources, certainly they are going to start wanting to diversify <laughs> if they've been right. using only OpenAI technologies, then... Um, you know, like, I, I think that it, Google is definitely positioning itself right now. Of if you don't want to have a massive amounts of risk, then go right. with our product, even if it might not be as good, you know. Um, but for, for companies that don't have the resources or consumers that um, don't necessarily understand, like, there, there's still many consumers, you know, I, I've been traveling a lot in the global south, I spent a lot of time in Rwanda and Kenya this year, like, there are people there that use ChatGPT or know about ChatGPT, but they don't really um, know that it comes from this company called OpenAI, um, they don't necessarily realize that it's people that are making the decisions and that there can be all this kind of fracas <laughs> that right. leads to um, the tool not working or, or whatever. Um, and so for those people, I think um, it's still it's sort of the brand name of ChatGPT is still so strong that they're just going to gravitate towards it and not necessarily realize that there's all of these like this hidden turmoil under it and that it's actually somehow exporting certain types of ideologies to them. Um, and it's this is I hope that regulators have been paying attention this week because what this really all demonstrates, in my opinion, is that we have allowed this technology, we as a society have allowed this really powerful technology that ultimately affects all of us to be developed by a small handful in obscurity, like without any transparency, any accountability measures. And I hope that regulators now think about ways to actually at the very least, just increase transparency so that more people around the world can actually participate in the most consequential technology of our era. I mean, we can we can hope we can hope. And I know that I get a sense from how my WhatsApp was uh, was buzzing a little bit that a few regulators are, are now you know, thinking about these these questions in, in new ways. And Karen, I can't believe that we this is the first time we've spoken synchronously um I, just before we we sign off do you, can you say something about about the book and uh when when it's due what it's going to be called and and and, and so on 
Yeah, it's um the book is is going to be published by Penguin Press. Great. Um, and I'm still not even halfway through the manuscript, so it's not coming out next year. Supposedly, we'll see. I'm having a chat with my book editor next week. Right. Um, but it's it's going to be like a, basically an exploration of everything that we've talked about today, um, both the company opening itself, but also just the power struggles that happen with the development of such a consequential technology, how it actually interfaces with communities around the world, not just the big companies, um, not just the rich and resourced um, areas, uh, to to really examine like how do we actually get to a place where um, technology works for everyone? Because it is it is a lofty Silicon Valley goal, but it is also a, it's a good goal to have. And, it is a great uh, goal, yeah. And we should continue using that aspiration as a way to um, con- continuously iterate, provide feedback, critique our current processes so that we can get there. Well, so for listeners, some point in 2025, you have to set aside a weekend, make sure you've got some nice coffee and some comfy clothes to sit on your couch and uh, and read uh, Karen's book. Uh, Karen, thanks so much for making the time today. Thank you so much, Azim. That's wonderful. Great.